Welcome to the LA Soccer Hub Show. My name is Gio Garcia. Today is Monday, March 8th. Uh, coming to you guys, talking LAFC. LAFC had the press call today and here to help me talk about all things black and gold. We got Alicia Rodriguez. Alicia, how are you doing? Doing well, Gio. Uh, how are you doing today? Pretty good, pretty good. You know, finally got, got to hear what Bob Bradley had to say. Had a great weekend, watched a little bit of UFC. You know, can't complain. So I'm excited to start the this new week of March. You know, it seems like this year's flying by, but it, it, it's looking bright. You know, it looks like we're going to have fans in the stadium. So I'm, I'm excited. How was, how was your weekend? Yeah, it was good. Uh, you know, working and taking care of the family and all that good stuff, but uh, no complaints on my side. I I, uh, I felt energized, so I want to roll with that as much as possible. Yeah, I like that. And I should also mention to the people listening, this podcast may be uh, a little shorter than usual. I'm having technical difficulties. My charger is not charging my laptop, so we may have to cut the podcast a little short um, for that. And I, I need to get a new uh, charger. I mean, I got this laptop a couple years ago, so I, I think I either need to upgrade or, you know, invest in a better charger, but that's just the way it goes. But nevertheless, let, let's talk some LAFC. Like I said earlier, we had Bob Bradley speak to the media. We also had Tristan Blackman you know, and Duarte Twesta. Um, you know, I really liked how they were able to talk about, you know, the team there, you know, even Tristan Blackman was able to talk about his situation that he currently is. You know, Duarte Twesta talked about, you know, LAFC winning titles. Um, but before I get into all of that, happy International Women's Day. Do I have that right? Is it international? Yes, it is. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, dude, don't, I have to shine the light on you because I was like, oh, there was something I was supposed to say to her, but I remember now. No, thank you. Uh, it's, it's nice to see all the um, support for women who uh, still remain uh, a minority, I think, um, in sports you know, many facets of sports and sporting world, including media. So um, yeah, it was nice to have some people uh, give some shout outs today and thank you for the, uh, the props. And uh, hopefully, you know, we can continue to support everyone, uh, you know, when we're, we're doing all this work. Yeah. And one of those things that you mentioned, you know, obviously women are, are typically the minority in sports, but also you guys also stick out in a way that, you know, when you, like you yourself, you do such a great job. You know, everybody knows that I know that everyone that I know knows of you. Let's put it that way, right? Everybody, every journalist, every, you know, people on social media, they refer to your articles. Um, so obviously if you know what you're talking about right, and you put it in the work, right. And everybody, and that's why I like having you on here because it's, it's always a great conversation back and forth with you. And, you know, you, you share now a lot of knowledge, but uh, I just want to say you also, you know, stick out in a positive way because of all the work you've done. Well, thanks very much Gio. I really appreciate that. I'm glad I'm not um, bringing shame on my agenda. So thank you. <laughs> Definitely not bringing any shame. Maybe you're probably bringing some shame to our agenda, but hey, that's the way it is. We're men, we can definitely handle that. Um, but yeah, let, let's talk about Bob Bradley. What did you think about his uh, his press conference today? Yeah, I thought it was uh, more or less in line with what we probably expect at this point. Um, unlike the LA Galaxy's press conference, which was you know new people, new approaches, some freshness. I think in contrast with LAFC, uh, we kind of know what we're getting with, with Bob at, at this point. And I think he kind of hit some of the um, common talking points that he has, including uh, we're always trying to get better. We're always trying to play our football. You know, those are the things that he says uh, pretty much week in and week out. Um, but I think it's, it's worth, uh, em you know, emphasizing, um, you know, he's, he's not making any radical changes this year. I think those who watch the team closely aren't, you know, they wouldn't expect that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, kind of settling into something kind of comfortable, let's say for LAFC they're in season four. And, um, I think they're motivated to, to do better than what they did last year. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very interesting with, with obviously the way they finished the, the, the season, right? The CONCACAF, they, they, I feel like they finished off on a high note, but at the same time, they came up just short of the actual goal of, of being, you know, winning the CONCACAF. So, you know, I feel like it leaves them with motivation, but also wanting, like, you know, Eduardo Torres to talk about winning titles. You know, I think even the fans, right, you know, going into the fourth year, which is which is a lot to demand, but with the type of talent that they have, uh, it's pretty reasonable. And I think, you know, this this year, <clears throat> you know, obviously you start out, you start out, you start with the smaller goals, but it's like, 
you know, the realistic, the realisticness of this team winning a championship, I think will come down to how their defense plays, how their goalkeeping plays, and who is their third DP. You know, I know Bob Bradley talked about Brian Rodriguez. He could potentially come back or, you know, if they make a summer move and what happens with that third DP, I think that's all going to, uh, you know, going to mix with how their season will go. And I think it's very interesting that, you know, they they brought in a lot of reinforcements on the defensive end. And, you know, you saw players like Kim Mumon getting picked up and Marco Fafan. And I, I think it's just once we actually see some of the scrimmages and are able to see who's able gonna, who's going to be in those places and how they actually look, I think we're, we're going to start to see how this team really is going to play out for the for the at least the first part of the season until the summer transfer window. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, I think uh, your list is good, but the only thing I would add to that is injuries. Uh, one thing yep. we saw last year was that the team was really decimated by injuries, and I think they handled Carlos Vela's uh, absence fairly well, but I think some of the other injuries uh, were, were a lot more costly um, for them at, at different points in the season, so that's also a big concern. Obviously, you can't um, completely prevent injuries. You know, they're going to happen to some extent, but um, if they can stay healthy, then obviously that's going to put them in a much better stead when they're looking uh, to win trophies this year. Yeah, and, and I think also with that, with the injuries, and this is like, you know, Bob Bradley was asked about his roster, and this is going to be his full roster until at least the, the summer transfer window. And I think that that's, what, that's what's going to make it interesting, right? Because they're, they're not going to have a third DP until May, until May or the summertime, um, if Brian Rodriguez comes back. But I, I think what makes it so interesting is who is going to step up, right? We've talked about this before. Is it going to be Corey Barrett? Is it going to be Danny Masovsky? Is it potentially going to be Dan Daniel Trejo? I know Bob Bradley talked about him. You know, he's still, that the game's a lot quicker for him and he's still getting used to a couple of different things. But I think when, when you look at that, I think a lot of it is going to be riding on Corey Barrett because of what they traded up for him. And there's still so much unknown that, you know, I haven't, I've watched some of his highlights, but I think, that's going to be the unknown factor for them if he's able to perform the way LFC expects him to perform. But if he doesn't, then you start to look at that potential third DP and where you start, who you bring in with that third DP. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think uh, this is a little bit of a, a risk with having Baird and Masovsky kind of being the players to sort of tied over uh, that attacking line until they figure out what's going to happen with, with the third designated player, like you said. Um, you know, I don't necessarily think that'll sink their season if if those guys maybe aren't playing at the level just because I think uh, Vela and, and Rossi will be, you know, strong as usual. I'm, I'm not expecting any big drop offs for them. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a little bit risky. And, and it's also, you know, it's a good opportunity for the guys, but it's also, you know, going to be an opening of sorts, I think, for for opposing defenses. That's one less player that you're going to have to really hone in on, um, you know, when it comes to like mark, you know, man marking, making sure they're not doing something audacious. Um, but at the same time, I think it's a good opportunity for, for the likes of Baird and, and Masovsky and possibly Trejo to um, see if they can get some, some run and, and, you know, integrate well in the team. And if they do, then, yeah, I think, I think Baird's really kind of an X factor at this point uh, for the team, just because we haven't seen him play with this, this team yet. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Another player that, you know, I actually got to ask a question to was, was Tristan Blackman, right? And, you know, he had a great performance in the, in the CONCACAF. And I asked him if he was, it was a little bit surprised that they picked up uh, Kim Mumwana right back after his performance. And he, he said, no, he's, he said he's excited about the competition. And he also went on, I'm just paraphrasing here, that he understands that, you know, it's part of the business. And, you know, I really liked his response. Obviously, what else could he say, right? No, I don't like that they did that, right? But uh it was a very uh, positive response and, you know, he was up for the challenge is what, what I took from it. And, you know, he knows what he has to do in order to get that, you know, to get that, to earn a spot to be that right back or potentially come off the bench and play, uh, uh, you know, a center back or wherever he is, wherever he comes in. I think, you know, I think he's going to be a player that will be happy. Obviously, if he starts, everybody wants to start. But if he comes off the bench, this, this is what I'm sensing if he comes off the bench that he is more, more than willing to take up that role. Yeah. I, uh, I, I thought Tristan was really interesting today. I, I think he had some really illuminating answers um, along with his answer about Kim joining the team and him being like, bring it on. I'm, I'm happy to see it. I want to see good players on this team. He also mentioned that he didn't think he played very well during the regular season last year. And 
Um, he saw CONCACAF Champions League as an opportunity to try and redeem himself and, and really get better, um, which I was a little bit surprised about because I didn't really see him being super weak during the regular season. I saw him being injured, and I think that that hurt the team a lot. But, you know, that's not something he can control necessarily. Um, but he was pretty honest in saying I, I needed to really step it up and I needed to get right mentally. And I did. And I felt like I finished the year on a good, good note. And um, yeah, so I, I thought it was it, his answers were really pretty interesting today. And it seems like he's really entering a level of maturity that I think is is good to see. Um, not that he was especially immature before, but, you know, I, 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 I sense a newfound maturity from him. And I think that that's uh, not a bad thing. Yeah, I, I sense that too, and just just the way his, his responses, and I think it just comes with the, with more experience, right? Uh, and to your point, just the maturity. I think, you know, you also saw him saying wearing the Angel City uh, mask, right? Which which is pretty cool, just to just to promote that. But I think I got that sense he was more calm. Uh, he understood. He's been through this process. He understands. You know, I, I, he seemed like he, really, he was really well prepared to, uh, for this press conference and very confident of his situation. And you know. And I think that's what you want, right? I think that's what you want if you're Bob Bradley. I think that's what you want if you're LAFC because this is not a player that, you know, uh, after his performance, I, I expect not, I feel like if you're a fan, if you're Tristan Blackman, that you shouldn't expect anything less of what we saw from the CONCACAF because that's that's the best I've, I've ever seen him. And that's the best competition that LAFC has ever had in their short career. And he performed really well. And, you know, we saw him, I think you asked him about getting called up for the U.S. men's national team. You know, that only happens because he put in the work, right? That, that, he, he put in more, the work he earned every minute of CONCACAF and, and you know, and, and he was able to call, get called up for the U.S. men's national team. Unfortunately, I believe he got injured or he got concussed, something like that, or which kept him out, which is unfortunate. But when you're on the U.S. men's national team radar, especially with the type of talent that they have and, you know, the, top, the type of opportunities that could come from that, I think it's very exciting. And I hope he's able to get another callback. I think we will also have to see how he does this season as well. Yeah, it's a big season for him, just like it is for a lot of players. But I think for him in particular, trying to fight for, for playing time, you know, show that he can keep on developing, you know, keep on getting better. Um, if he can make another step up, then, you know, he's going to be really good. And um, he might start to get, you know, European interests, that kind of thing. So, you know, I think there's some motivation for him there too. Yeah, yeah. Lot, lots of opportunities for him. And, you know, I'm excited also to see what, what happens with, 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 the, cent with the center center backs, right? Uh, we're assuming it's going to be Jesus Murillo and Eddie Segura. You know, Bob Bradley talked about, you know, them picking up Jesus Murillo's option. Um, and obviously that's very key for LAFC. I've really liked how they played. And I think you have that Colombian connection now we, we're going to see a full season with Jesus Mourinho and Eddie Segura, which I'm assuming is going to be there. And what will potentially, uh, you know, how, how they can lock that defense down there. You know, I think when Mourinho came in uh, within in the middle of the season, it's always hard, right? Towards the end of the season, it's always hard. I think now understanding Bob Bradley's system and how they want to play, I think he's a player I'm also going to look to have, uh, you know, to be able to take it to the next level. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he was an immediate upgrade and, like you said, in really rough circumstances, just being thrown in the deep end with the season kind of on the line. I think he played great. And uh, yeah, and Champions League, he was tremendous. So, you know, if he can continue to push on, then it really should help LAFC's defense considerably. And, and hopefully they won't be nearly as leaky this year. Yeah, so another, another player that was on the press call was uh, Eduardo Tuesta. You know, he, he talked about winning titles. He was also talked about, he was also asked, I believe in Spanish, it was about getting, you know, getting for the transfer window, you know, aspirations of going to Europe. And I'm just going to paraphrase here. He just pretty much said he's focused on this season uh, and whatever comes, comes, you know, but he's right now, he's focused on the team. Obviously, he wants to, obviously, just like any player would want to go to Europe. But I, th I think I really like this answer that he's, he's going to focus on this and whatever opportunities come for him you know, he's going to take a look out, but I think his number one goal right now is LAFC. And then I, I think for every player, right, it should be LAFC. If you're, if you're with this team, regardless if you want to go to Europe or not, I think if you're focused in this team and you do what you're supposed to do with your team and, you know, exceed expectations, then I feel like those are opportunities are, will come. And I think those are going to come for Eduardo Tuesta as well. Yeah. He's definitely a player that maybe he doesn't get quite the press that Rossi or, or Rodriguez get as far as, drawing interest from Europe just because he's not an attacker and he's not, you know, 
banging in goals all the time and, and getting all that attention, but he definitely is one of the top uh, prospects for, for being sold abroad in the league, no doubt about it. Um, he's from Colombia. He's arguably kind of on the verge, you know, won't, maybe won't take long for him to, to be called into Colombia's uh, national team one day. Um, and so that should help, you know, his stock abroad because Colombia is a, is a good country and is well regarded in Europe. So that shouldn't hurt him. So I think if he has a really good season, um, he very well could draw interest as well. And I'm with you. I mean, I think he had kind of the right balance. Of course, every player wants to go to Europe, but um, you know, he's, he's not, he didn't strike me as somebody who's, who's pushing for a move out. Um, you know, he's engaged with what he's doing right now and he wants to, uh, if this is the last year that he's here, he wants to go out on a high note. And I think that's exactly the, the kind of tone you want a player to take. Yeah, and there's an exact quote I, I got here. It's, it's time to start winning titles and that's our next step, end quote. And I think that's right, you know, uh, with the time he spent with LAFC, right? They've come close. And, you know, unfortunately for him, we, we know what happened in CONCACAF. He wasn't able to play a final game and we saw the drop off right in the midfield uh, towards the end of the game right but when uh, when LAFC played Tigres we saw the drop off towards the end of the game and, and you know you can only imagine right that, that's all we can do right you can only imagine if Eduardo Twessa was playing the game and you know how he, he potentially was a can control the game and that's what he does I, I see him as a point guard uh, of LAFC how he controls everything how he gives the passes to Diego Rossi for goals or Carlos Vela you know he really understands you know, what he needs to do in the midfield and how he can control the game. And, you know, I, I feel like he's the most important player to LAFC, out, right? I understand Carlos Vela, I understand Diego Rossi, but the way he controls that midfield, you know, a lot of uh, what, so what soccer is, is being able to control the midfield, but also being able to capitalize. But I think just the passes and, and it, just his IQ on the field, it's amazing. And, and obviously he doesn't get the rec recognition because he's, he maybe he's not as flashy, maybe he doesn't talk as much, but I think, you know, any team, uh, if, wherever he goes in Europe, is, is going to be able to, it's going to be very, ex very excited and very happy with what he has to bring to the team. Yeah, I, I was a little bit surprised, uh, not that I didn't think he deserved it, but in 2019, you know, he was MLS best 11 when they won the Supporter Shield. I think it was absolutely deserved, but it was, it was one of those where um, he, you know, like you said, he's not a flashy player, so you don't necessarily expect him to, to get an honor like that, but that year, you know, LAFC were three of the 11, best 11 in, in MLS, and, and he was one of them. Um, and when he was hurt last season um, at the end of the MLS's back tournament, you know, he didn't come back for several games and they really struggled out of the gate uh, when they came back locally to play. Um, so I think in his absence, you really saw what the team lost. Um, and like you said, in the, in the Champions League final, worst possible scenario, you're, you're losing one of your best players for the biggest game. And yeah, like Vela was, was kind of marked out of that game, which was a little bit of a surprise. Um, he's really not been marked out of games really in his, you know, MLS career so far. I know that they're not necessarily connected on a string, but you know, you, you, you kind of think of what ifs, like what if uh, Atuesta was on the, on the field, able to pull the strings a little bit better in, in the passing game maybe he could have unlocked Vela once or twice and, mm -hmm. and that could have flipped the game, you know, like right. that's kind of what the margins were for that match. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's one of those big, what ifs really is what if Atuesta hadn't gotten that bogus uh, red card in, in the semifinal and, you know, who knows what might've happened. They might've played Bayern Munich and uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> who well, knows what might've happened there, but they might've they, played Bayern Munich in front of an international audience. Yeah. But, uh, I, I feel like that's what everybody, you know, uh, the way Tigres, you know, went to the final LAFC, uh, I've seen that from LAFC fans, and I think you can only imagine, right? But unfortunately for them, they didn't get there. Unfortunately for them, they won't be playing this year in the CONCACAF. And I think that's that's the thing that it's also difficult. They, they weren't able to make it in CONCACAF because of, you know, the, the difficult season that they had, you know, so many challenges. But I think, I think with the type of talent LAFC has, I think I feel like they should be in CONCACAF every year. Uh, they ju just with that talent, is, they should be. And unfortunately, they're not this year. But I think uh, where the way things go this year, I, I expect them to be there next year and, and compete. Now, whether they have a Twista, Carlos Vela, I mean, Diego Rossi, that's a whole other story. But I think, you know, with the type of talent and the, and the head coach, uh, Bob Bradley, I think you, you should always have aspirations and, and be in CONCACAF. 
Uh, another thing that Bob Bradley mentioned was he still hasn't seen a, a MLS schedule. I think he retweeted this, or you tweeted this about, about the, you know, about the season. We're we're almost a month away, which is it's not it's not surprising, but I think you kind of want to start seeing the schedule a little bit, right? And I think MLS is a little bit behind. We finally they finally you know the teams finally released the preseason. Uh, they're going to be facing. New England, they're going to have a scr- intramural scrimmage between each other and then two games versus New England Revolution. Uh, I think that's very interesting. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm surprised they, they didn't get teams, you know, maybe San Jose or, you know, get some USL teams. Uh, you got, you know, Orange County, you got, you know, Phoenix Rising, you even got Las Vegas Lights, who's going to be there affiliate. So well, that, that's going to be their team. So that's basically the inter- intramural uh, scrimmage, I think. Oh, okay, right there. Okay, okay, well, I don't know officially, but, you know, in, informally, I think that's probably what it's going to end up being. But um, yeah, I think it's a little bit surprising that they only have basically two games um, against external opponents on the schedule. And, and Bob did say that there was a chance they could add somebody else. But I looked at, at last year's uh, preparations. And of course, last year they had the the Champions League games right off the bat to start the season. They only played four games last year. So it's not actually that different. And there are teams in MLS who in non COVID times would schedule six, eight, you know, even 10 games um, over the course of of a six week preseason. Um, LAFC hasn't really done it like that. So I think it must just be more their approach. and, And they think less is more kind of let's, you know, focus the games as kind of, big tentpole events for the week. And then the rest of the time, we're just going to be training really hard. Um, I think in, if they were brand new and they were only starting out with two games, I'd be like, wow, that does not sound right. But because they've been around the block, it's mostly the same group. Um, I think they probably have their system now. And so uh, maybe it's not such a big deal, but um, also because we're in the pandemic, you know, you teams can't necessarily, schedule 50 games in the preseason. So um, I think most teams are kind of cutting back a little bit on their um, preseason scrimmages, but yeah, most teams are doing more than two games. Like uh, the revolution alone are playing four games in Los Angeles because they're playing uh, LAFC twice and they're playing the galaxy twice. Um, So they alone are playing twice as many games against external opponents as, as LAFC. But again, I think that's what they think that's all they need. And if they're killing each other in, um, training, metaphorically speaking, then, you know, so be it. That's, that's what they think will, will get them to be ready for the season. Yeah. I mean, if that's what they need, that's what they need. I, I was just surprised of, you know, not having different looks, you know, just being right. revolution, being the same thing. Cause you know, I think you want a different look, you want a different, you know, obviously I'm not a coach, but you, I feel like you would want a different look, different defenses, different offenses to see how, a Kim Wan reacts to see how Marco Farfan, to see how Corey Bear or Danny Masovsky, right? Or to see, you know, even in the back, uh, the goalkeeper situation. Um, that wasn't asked. And I, and I wanted to ask him, I wanted to ask Bob Bradley, like, um, does he expect to have a, if, if everybody's healthy, right? Both Pablo Cisneros and Kenneth Lemire are healthy. Does he expect to have a hybrid, like going back and forth like they did last year? Or is this going to be the year that LFC is going to have their number one? goalkeeper and uh, obviously that that's still yet to be unknown um but I, i'm very interested to see who, who who's going to start for them uh in the preseason because i think whoever starts the first preseason game uh, the, I, that could not i mean tells me who they have the most confidence i could be wrong on that but I, obviously i think kenneth vermeer may play one game and then pablo cisnegas <laughs> may play the other game uh right and there there's two games so that we can't really predict right so it's it's going to be interesting, especially on that end, because, you know, they, there's still so much unknown and, you know, and who, who do they go with and do they go back and forth? And I don't I don't know. I don't really think that's the best recipe. But if that's how they feel about it, uh, I think that's I, that's that's how they're, they're going to have to go with the back and forth. But I, I don't I don't I just don't really like that because I, I saw sometimes that publishers and I guess and Kenneth Vermeer uh, at times um, weren't as confident because of so much of the back and forth. Yeah, I mean, I really have no way of projecting what's going to happen just because, like you said, it's, it's, it seems so up in the air. I mean, it's possible that Bob has picked his starter and is locked in stone, but I think there's it's probably pretty likely that he hasn't picked a starter for sure, and it's kind of open open competition. We'll see what happens. Um, so I don't know. I mean, 
yeah, I, I think uh, we'll definitely ask him uh, as we get closer to the season um, at some point and, and he'll probably either give us a, I'm still working on it or, you know, give us a definitive answer. He's, he usually is pretty honest in his assessments. So um, we'll see, but yeah, I mean, I really cannot project, you know, I can project like nine or 10 of the, of the starting lineup, but I cannot project who's going to be starting in goal and, and how often that person's going to be in goal. So like you said, I really expect that they're going to each of the top two are going to play uh, each of the games. So I don't think that there's any, we're going to get any kind of hint based on that necessarily, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. And another thing uh, up top, he was also asked about, uh, you know, Danny Trejo. And I think one interesting that I think that I remember is that he said that Danny Trejo would play any of the top three positions and it wasn't just striker. And, you know, I think it, that I haven't seen him play. I've seen some of his highlights. I, I, I thought he was a striker, but uh, I, he called Bob Bradley called him an attacker. So I can just mean any of the top three. So I think that's just very interesting. And I think uh, we're going to see, I'm assuming we may see some of uh, what he, he can produce. I think he's going to be a player that may be playing in the USL team, which is nothing wrong with that. I think he's a player that they're, they're going to want to develop um, just with the, everything that I have. But um, I'm very interested to see where, where they position him and what his how, what, how many opportunities he will get with already with already tight lineup up there. And, you know, and also, you know, what they actually, because when you're up top, you, you got to produce. And I feel like, you know, he, 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 still, he still may need some development. Yeah, but like if, if the USL thing comes through, which we expect it will, and, and LAFC will take over sporting operations of Las Vegas, um, he may be signed to an LAFC deal and then get loaned out, or he may be signed to a Vegas deal and then they have the possibility of, of bringing them up to LAFC at some point. Um, I think either way, it's fine because, you know, and if he gets playing time with LAFC, all the better. I mean, that's, that's not bad either, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that, yeah, the idea of having the, the setup with the USL team is to give players like him more of an opportunity. Um, Bob was asked about the Academy uh, mm. pros as well. I think it's going to be pretty similar. Like, Obviously, we saw Christian Torres get a good run uh, last year, and I, I think he'll probably be in line for some more playing time this year. He, he looked really quite good for his age last year, I thought, um, in MLS, but I wouldn't be shocked at all if Tony Leone is sent to uh, USL and, and just gets a run there for a while to, to really get some pro minutes under his belt and see how he's doing, um, or any of them, really, all, all three of them. But since Tony's in a pretty critical position, he's a center back, he hasn't played in MLS yet, that might be a way to kind of get him to uh, get his sea legs and the pro game a little bit easier instead of just getting thrown in in MLS in a, a really high leverage situation. Um, you know, so I think that that's exactly what the, the arrangement's gonna be for is, is for players like that who um, either aren't really gonna see playing time or need some time to get some seasoning, give them an opportunity in the USL. I think the quality of play is increasing tremendously in that league. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's good. And that's kind of what you want to see. So, um, and, and a lot of times what we see with other MLS two teams is there are a couple players who may start out the season in, in USL and then they earn the contract or they earn the recall back to, uh, the MLS team and they get some playing time down the stretch. And, and if the season is going to be really packed, like I think it probably will be again this year. Um, that may be the path for some of those guys to, to get um, playing time with the MLS team uh, down the stretch in, in the season. Yeah, you, you completely reminded me of Christian Torres. I, I forgot to bring up his name. I mean, that, that is another player that, that I'm excited to see how he develops, right? And this is um, LAFC's first time developing a player from, from their academy to the first team. And, you know, everybody has high aspirations for what he did, you know, from the things that he did last year. And I'm very interested as well how he's going to be able to impact the team this season, right? You know, obviously I'm assuming he, he's going to come off the bench, potentially may be able to get some starts depending if there's injuries and stuff. But I think, you know, we, we saw him score a goal against Portland last season. I think he, I think he only got, had one goal, but he was a, with that goal, he, he tied the game for them, which was essentially was a, was a, was a win. Any, I think that game, if any game, if you tie any game, I think that was a game that kind of felt like a win because they were they were away and they were losing and he was, he was able to score. But, um, you know, like I said, I'm very excited to see how he's able to develop with the LAFC, you know, with the academy and with the first team. And, you know, obviously, you know, years down the line, he could be the next Carlos Vela 
right? Maybe he could not. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things going on there, but I feel like a player, player like him, he doesn't have the pressure, right? Because there there is Carlos Vela, there is Diego Rossi, and right now he can just be the student and he can just learn from them and how they go about things. So then when it when it's his time, he he can shine, or when or he just goes straight to Europe, right? When you know, or he can just go straight to Europe and continue his development out there. So I'm very interested to see, you know, down the line how things work for work out for Christian Torres. But another player that I want to talk about is um, Brian Rodriguez. Barbelli, you know, mentioned Brian Rodriguez a couple of times and you were asked about him. And I got this quote right here. <clears throat> he says, Brian uh, is, a very, is, a ta- is a talented player and there's teams that are looking at him. We felt that in all ways that, w- that this was going to work for him, whether that, that means an opportunity in Europe or it helps him get back, or it helps him get better, it comes back here, end quote. Uh, wh- what did you make of uh, Bob Riley's comments in, in that quote about Brian Rodriguez? Um, I, I mean, my sense is still that uh, Rodriguez wanted to leave and LAFC didn't want him to leave, but kind of had their hand forced and so had to go along with it everything that they've said publicly has been, you know, complimentary of the player. They don't want to, they don't want to bad mouth him because that's going to tank his transfer value. So they, you know, talk him up and say, yeah, it's a great opportunity for him. We wish him the best. And we, you know, we hope he does really well. And, you know, if he comes back, we're gonna be so excited. Um, But I think it's probably a situation where they're really pretty hope, you know, hoping uh, that he gets, bought and they can kind of wash their hands of it and move on and he can move on he doesn't have to come back disgruntled and you know they can kind of move on to the next dp i know that they're looking for that next dp um you know they're they're hard at work right now but they all obviously have to wait and see what happens with rodriguez before they can pull the trigger on any kind of deal so um, they're a little bit in a holding pattern but i also think that they probably don't think it's the worst thing in the world if their expensive want away player is you know, purchased and they can kind of move on and, you know, be done with it. But so I think in that vein, that's kind of what I think is what Bob means is, you know, he's trying to be complimentary of the player so that they can, you know, find a resolution to the the situation in the end, but also keeping the door open just in case he does come back and, um, you know, maybe he won't be thrilled, but they'll have to kind of put it, give him an olive branch and see if he'll come around. Um, so they don't want to <laughs> slam the door. Yeah, that, that's the sense of that, what I got, you know, because uh, Brian Rodriguez, the sense I got, he was done with L- LAFC. He was just done. And, I mean, he literally said, I yeah. am not coming back to LA. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and obviously, and what else could Bob Bradley say, really say, right? So, but also, the, you, there's two there's two things to your point that how LAFC and Bob Bradley are playing this is they're not going to badmouth them because it's going to bring down his value. And two, they also know that it's a real, real really high possibility that he comes back. And the reason why I feel like he comes back is one, um, whatever the thresholds that they didn't want to share, and I know why they don't want to share because I don't, I think those are, I don't think Brian Rodriguez is potentially going to meet those thresholds. The reason why I say that he's only played right now 37 minutes in what we got one, two, three, four, five, six, He's only played 37 minutes in six. Well, let's say five, because February 6th is a game. I don't. I think he got sent away. Um, he's only played 37 minutes in five games, realistically. And last game was his best game. He played 27 minutes. He came off the bench and he had an assist. Um, that is great. It's it's looking better for him. But he, he I don't think uh, when you when you loan out a player or, or when you transfer a player. Uh, I think we had the expectations that he would be starting sometime around now. Obviously, I don't know how talented Amaria is, but if he's going to a sec- <clears throat> second division uh, Spanish La Liga team, I was expecting that, you know, all right, he's going to get some playing time. You know, he's going to start. He hasn't started yet. Maybe the next game he starts. Or, you know, I don't, I, I'm not covering the team. I don't know. But I think what I'm sensing uh, if he hasn't been able to start as of yet is because there, there is, there is, there is a lot of competition out there, right? And it's great that, you know, he got them the assist and essentially they won because of his assist because they won 1-0. And maybe this can change things for him. Maybe this can change things for him. But I think the reason why he's going to have to come back to LAFC, it's not because um, Brian Rodriguez wants to come back. I think it's because LAFC doesn't get what they want in the sell-on clause. And I know we've talked about this, but I'm still going off the number. 
11.5 million dollars that's on transfer market i know they i know there's been reports out there that may be lower or not but lafc hasn't said anything and i'm just going off transfer market to 11.5 million dollars i don't think lafc is going to want to sell him for anything less than that and if they do i think it's going to be it's going to be looked on potentially bad on them if they sell them for less than what they bought them for you know you don't want to lose lose especially investors money that, that you invested all this money and you know if, if they if brian rodriguez doesn't pan out out there and i think that's why i was very interested i was very curious when bob Bradley said you know if he comes back here like bob Bradley's opening the door for him to come back here because it's 11.5 million dollars and you're not just going to lose that money you know you, you're just not and you know uh, Brian Rodriguez, if he doesn't make it out there, he may have to eat some humble pie with himself and with the fans. And, you know, they can make it work. They can make anything work. But now, if Brian Rodriguez is like, nah, I'm not going back, then that's when it gets ugly. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think you make great points all around. Um, the, the thing I would add is I think the purchase option was like 16 to 20 million. Um, so if Almeria make La Liga and he's a key player, then maybe that's something that they're going to pony up. I believe their uh, owner is uh, somebody who bought the team like a year ago. He's pretty rich. He's, he's really put a lot of money into trying to get them promoted. So it's possible that he would do that. Um, I think if they don't get promoted, it's like a 0% chance he's going to get, you know, purchased for 16 to 20 million. Um, that's a really steep price. I also think that even if they do but go do to La Liga. But do you think he's worth that though? Do you think Without, with all the talent that's out, out there in the world, obviously I know he's playing with them, but 16 million, uh, that seems really high, doesn't it? Uh, it seems pretty high. Um, he is an Uruguayan international though. Like that's such an exclusive club, honestly. And I think that there is so much cachet with, with Uruguayan internationals in general. Like I just think that European teams, especially teams in Spain, Italy, like they love Uruguayan. So um, to me, I think it's more of what is like, what's the context around Almeria at the time when they're able to make the decision and what's the owner like willing to do? Like, I think if they stay in the second division, it's like, what's the point? Like he has paid out some pretty sizable transfer fees. I don't know if it's been 20 million. I think it's been more on the line of like, uh, 10 to 12 million maybe for the record fee, um, in the last year or so since he's taken over. Um, which is obviously quite a bit down from, you know, the stated uh, reported number. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the MLS context, he's not worth that. Of course not. Um, but I do think that that, that, you know, his, his passport, like it is so alluring to so many mm -hmm. teams. And that's one of the things that's really kind of weird about uh, Rossi's situation is he's a guy that's like literally banging in the goals, being the golden boot winner and, you know, I don't know why teams aren't beating down his door because I think he would be so good in so many leagues, but um, I don't know. I'm not sure what the difference, maybe it's just a matter of he hasn't gotten that first cap yet. And so they're waiting for him to get that cap. And maybe once he does, maybe the, you know, the suitors will come banging down the door. But for Rodriguez, I think it's, I think it's his international status that, that is really intriguing to all these teams. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I agree with you on that, that it's intriguing. I think just in the world market, I don't know if he's worth that much money at right now with everything going on with uh, right now. I mean, they got to, I think the, their, their contract ends uh, until May 30th is their last game. on um, So there, there's more than enough time. There's more than enough time for him to, you know, get into that starting lineup and, you know, him getting this assist. And, but I feel like there's so many things that, um, I think El Maria has to make it to first division. That's one thing. There's also, uh, I think, personal thresholds that, that's in the contract, which we don't know what it is. I think uh, I'm just going off of, you know, what the other ones were that Brian Rodriguez ha would have to play 75% of all the games. I don't know how much time. Did he, does he have to get right. six goals? Does he have to get five assists? You know, that's what makes it tricky. And uh, without us knowing that, we can only assume. But I think I don't know. If he's able to meet those, if they able, I think if they're able to make it first division, all right, you got a shot. You know, there, there's a shot, but I, I don't know what, what the performance metrics are because um, unless he takes his game to, to the next level over there in Almeria and he's able to start scoring and start assisting and, you know, really make some impact, obviously five games is five games. You know, that's, that's just a small batch. 
and he's only played 37 game, 37 minutes uh, in five games, in five potential games that he, he was able to come up. So I think it's looking it's looking better for LAFC, but I think, you know, Bob Bradley make, making those comments of, you know, essentially opening the door for him to come back uh, also makes it very interesting. And with that, without, with, without Brian Rodriguez's situation being handled, you know, that's where LAFC is in limbo because they're not, they're not going to be able to get a, a third DP. And if he is their third DP, I just feel like after being in, in, in Spain, you know, March, April, May, three, three months, right? Is he really going to want to come back to, LA, to LAFC after he said he wasn't going to come back? <laughs> I just don't see that. You know, I just don't see, even if I feel like, even if he has a bad season, I, I don't think he, he's like, no, loan me out or, you know, because he's done it once and I could see that happening again. Yeah, maybe, but it also might be a matter of maybe uh, Oscar Tabara's, you know, with the Uruguayan national team tells him like straighten out, dude, like you cannot be True. going on strike left and right and center. Like you had your chance. Now you need to go back to your club. Maybe his agent, you know, speak some sense into him for once. Like, you, <laughs> I, never I, know. Yeah, like yeah, there could be you know, maybe his mom gets on the phone and tells him to straighten out. Like, there could be a lot of things. It could be the grass is not always greener on the other side. And he realizes, okay, I guess, you know, LAFC is not as terrible as I thought it was. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, we just have to wait and see what happens. And, um, you know, he's shooting his shot now and we'll see how it turns out for him. Yeah, no, I don't think, I don't think he thinks LAFC is bad. I think he, his goal was to be in Europe. And now, you know, when your goal is to be in Europe and you're there, I feel like it's hard to go back. It's just hard, you know? Yeah, for sure. But I mean, there's lots of players who, you know, their, their career doesn't follow the, you know, hometown club to the big club in, in my country to, uh, you know, a, a smaller European club to Barcelona or Juventus or Manchester United. Like there's a lot, you know, not that many players that have that trajectory, right? Like it's, it's pretty unusual. And so you see guys who kind of, you know, cycle back and forth, zigzag around in, in the course of their careers and, he may be one of those players and he may have to kind of come to terms with that. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. I think this is more of a question for the fans, you know, ask, do you want Brian? <laughs> we would have to ask them, do, would you want Brian Rodriguez back? You know, I, I could hear, I could I hear a lot of people saying no, I could hear a lot of people saying yes, you know, and I think that's, that's just the tricky thing. Um, you know, unfortunately this is a situation that they're in and, and this is the first that LFC has a, uh, you know, been in this type of situation, but, you know, I think you hope for the best for Brian Rodriguez and you hope for the best for LAFC because if you're able to look past, you know, say that they get the situation handled, they sell them, right? For whatever amount of money they sell them. Then you start looking at, you know, potentially, you know, a center forward, you know, a striker, right? I know Takuna Guerrero has been talked about a lot, you know, uh, Costa as well, and, uh, you know, Garrett talked about Costa. You know, but I think the possibilities I feel like are endless for LAFC if they're able to move on from Brian Rodriguez. Yeah, and you know, I don't know if we've talked about this on the show before, but they kind of have to start thinking about a succession plan too for the likes of Vela and and to an extent Rossi as well. Like they they need to start planning out for that the next like three years. Um, maybe they get a, a player like Aguero and you know they go all in this year. That's also possible, but I think with what we've seen from the team, they're more kind of looking towards having a sustainable, you know, club over time. And I think the, the post Vela era is going to be very interesting to see how they manage that. If they're going to have a huge drop off, or if they're going to be able to kind of weather it and, and, you know, keep a good team throughout, even if the players are, are turning over. So um, no pressure because they've had a real hard time with third DP, but this next third DP could be a, a really important one for the club. Yeah, yeah, and it's very. I think it's also very interesting what happens with Carlos Vela, right? If you just decide, you know, I just want to hang my boots after this last year, or you say you could, you know, you could play for another. You know, I think he's what thirty-two years old. You can play for another five years if you wanted to, or maybe not. Maybe you can just enjoy his life with his with his family, you know, in LA. So, you you make a good point. You know, that third DP. Um, it's really, you know, you really have to start looking at the future. You really have to start looking at the future. And now we've, we've seen uh, outside of Bella, they've, they've gone young. Um, and, you know, that 30P, you know, it hasn't worked out for them. <clears throat> and is, it, is this where LAFC goes, you know, with an, with an older DP, with a more experienced DP? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but I think it's going to be an interesting summer for LAFC 
depending, you know, if, if Brian Rodriguez doesn't come back, I think, you know, the, the possibilities are endless for, for LFC and, and what they got moving forward. Um, but with that said, I got 5% left, Felicia. We, we pretty much made it, you know, we, we made it longer than I thought we were going to make it. Um, but with that said, do you have anything else to add before we, we log off of you? No, I think we're, we're really excited for the season. Uh, like you, I want to see the schedule really desperately, but I have a feeling MLS is probably going to, uh, you know, give us a month or two at a time to start with and we'll just have to take it, but anything will be good at this point. So I'm just looking forward to seeing what the dates are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all we know is April 17th and I believe 18th that weekend is when, when it starts, but we want to see the matchup. Do you want to see when LAFC versus LA Galaxy? When's the first El Trafico? You know, how many games, how many El Trafico? Yeah, let's not do six of them again. <laughs> exactly. Let, let's, let's not do that. But one thing to finish off, also Montreal, I believe, is going to be playing in Fort Lauderdale where, where Miami plays. So, you're, I, I mean, no surprise that you're going to start seeing a lot of the, mostly the Canadian teams being uh, playing in America because of, you know, of the pandemic and what's going on and their laws are a little bit different. But, you know, nevertheless, it's exciting. You know, even here in California, the government announced that yeah, you start in April, you know, when baseball starts yeah, and open stadiums, fans are going to be allowed, which means LAFC and also LA Galaxy fans are going to be allowed back in. Um, I don't know how many. Is it maybe just, you know, I think it was like 20, a third or 20 percent. I don't really know. But any any game with fans, it's always exciting, you know. Yeah, it's a big deal. Um, you know, obviously I hope it's safe. I don't want there to be a super spreader event, um, you know, as we reopen too early, but as long as everyone stays safe and they keep the numbers pretty low and hopefully people are getting vaccinated as they're, you know, deciding to go out to games, that would be great. Um, it's exciting. I mean, I, I think we had a, we, we muddled through as best we could last year, but it would be really nice to get back out and uh, see some live soccer again. Yep. And with that said, let the people know where they can follow you, Alicia. Sure. You can find my work about LAFC at angelsonparade.com and you can follow me on Twitter at Soccer Musings. Guys, make sure to give her a follow. If you guys want to follow me, you can follow me on Twitter at Gio Garcia LA. If you guys enjoyed this episode, make sure to give this a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. You can listen to this podcast on Spotify, wherever you get your music. For Alicia, this is Gio. We'll catch you guys next time. Bye, everybody.